He's the Mavericks head coach, Rick Carlisle, I believe, calling in right now. Is that right, Fritzy? He is standing by. He's standing by. Just signed a four-year contract extension. Rick joins us now. Congrats on the contract there, Rick. Dan, how are you? Thank I'm, you. I'm doing spectacular. Did Larry Bird once say you were the smartest player he ever played with? <laughs> I don't remember that, but if he, if he did, great. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure to put on you, isn't it? Uh, bring it on, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I want you to put on your analyst hat when you worked for ESPN. Now, if you were in the studio after watching the Heat last night, what would Rick Carlisle, the studio analyst, say? about the Miami Heat in the final couple of minutes last night? Well, I knew this was going to be a very tough series for them because, you know, we played Miami twice this year. We played Indiana once, and we played at our place. <clears throat> and they beat us senseless. I mean, they were really physical, really efficient. They had playmaking at multiple positions. They had size and strength. And, you know, they, they got a lot of different ways they can attack you, and they can guard you. So... Uh, look, end of the game last night. You know, you gotta, you gotta put, you gotta make free throws and you gotta make plays. It's just, you know, it doesn't matter which team you're talking about in the playoffs. It's going to come down to those things. But as a coach, how? I, I'm just trying to understand what the, what's the scouting report on the Heat when the game is on the line. Well, look, they've got, you know, with, even without Bosch, they've got two great, great players and guys that can break you down and not only hit shots but get get you know, terrific shots for other guys. And uh, look, a lot of times it's not about whether or not the stars are the stars. It's it's whether or not, you know, when the stars get somebody else's shot, they can step step into it and knock it in. And uh, look, we're two games into a seven-game series. So it's, it's, it's going to be a long series now. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I think it's going to this is going to come down to not not whether Wade and James play great, um, but you know who else can step up and give them some help. But I, I I guess I don't know what this is with the uh, and you know where I'm going with this and you're I, well actually I don't know where you're going. Oh, with with LeBron, he doesn't get the he doesn't shoot the ball. They get uh, you know the last two touches. Uh, he doesn't shoot, so he's got Wade and he's got Chalmers taking the last two shots there. You know, that, do you realize when you're playing against them that, you know, LeBron wants to defer that, that more than he wants to take that last shot? Does that play into your philosophy against them? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that that's necessarily true. A lot of times, you know, when you're a coach and you run a play late in the game like that, it's so hard to get a three when you need a three. <laughs> we ran a loop of, <clears throat> like, 45 or 50 need three plays at the end of games from the whole league because we were trying to, you know, come up with some things, some good ideas for our team. I mean, invariably, the initial action that you run, teams guard it, and you end up taking a different shot. I mean, so you've got to run something where, you know, it's, it'd be great if we get the ball in the Whiskey every time, but it just it just doesn't work that way because they're draped all over him. But it's called for him, though, right? You, you, you do go you, – you plan on going through Dirk. Well, he's always an option, of course, but they're going to take it away. They're going to take LeBron away, and they're going to try to take Wade away. So, look, I, Chalmers is a big-time clutch player. I mean, look what he did in the NCAA. He hit a big three on us last year in the finals in game two when we made it, when we made a mistake. I, I don't have a problem with, with Chalmers taking that shot if I'm, a, if I'm a coach. But you played with Bird. With, you know, Bird didn't like to defer. Yeah, I, and I, I don't know – I don't know that that's the mindset. I think you're making a, a, a very uh, a very rash assumption, Dan, and you know, I would caution you on that. You don't think that Bird would uh, – he wanted the ball. He wanted the shot, right? Yeah, and I, I don't think James – I don't think it's the case where James doesn't want the shot. I think, I think it's a case where defense took it away and somebody else got one. And in that case, uh, the, the, the point I'm making is you want an open shot. You know, I I don't want my best player to to have to take a shot where two guys are draped all over him. Yeah, and I agree with that. I just I want the ball in his hands because he's so good and so dangerous. But for him not to have the ball in his hands, then I have a problem with that. So, mate, do you understand? Your your, your complaint is noted. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We're talking to Rick Carlisle, the Mavs head coach, joining us, Dan Patrick Show. Difference between Oklahoma City this year and last year is what. Uh, another year of uh, experience, maturity. Guys are getting stronger. Guys are getting a stronger resolve. Um, game two tonight is a, is a very interesting game. And, and game twos, Dan, as you know, and I remember when you and I worked together 
four or five years ago, we talked about it because we were in the playoffs together. You know, that first win usually goes to the home team, and then the second the second game is when the road team has to adjust. And you know, that's where you've got to come back and win that game, and and really, and then it becomes a long series regardless. And so, the Lakers' ability to control tempo. Um, the impact that their bigs have on the inside with their length. Their bigs are the best passing bigs I've seen in this league in in decades. Uh, you know, Gasol and Bynum are, are phenomenal. And, you know, and then you got Bryant. And so, uh, you know, this game tonight is going to be all about tempo. Uh, if Oklahoma City can continue to shoot the ball the way they did in our series and the way they did in game one, I mean, they're going to be very hard to beat. There's no doubt about that. But, the Lakers tonight, I believe, are going to throw their best game out there that they've played in the entire playoffs. Yeah, they have to. I think that the fact that you have Friday and Saturday back-to-back with L.A. and given that Oklahoma City and their their youth, I, I just think they'll take one game there. And you know, it could be 3-1 three, three here before the end of the weekend. Unless the Lakers win tonight. Well, we'll see. We'll see. But, I, you know, this, this whole thing, you know, with eight teams left – um, it's very interesting. I mean, Boston has has got a great chance. Uh, Philadelphia has a great chance. Indiana has a great chance. You know, Miami has got to survive this thing without Bosch. Um, and you know, out west, uh, look, you know, San Antonio has won 14 games in a row. How frustrating is it to coach against a team like that? San Antonio? Yeah. You know what it is? They're they're the most precise team <laughs> that we have in the league, and. They, you know, look, they got Steven Jackson coming off the bench and playing like 20 minutes. Well, I mean, what does it mean? That's how good they are. When you say precise, they just, they, they do it correctly. They know what they're doing. They, 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 they absolutely, well, they, they do a couple of things extremely well. They're efficient at both ends of the floor, uh, but they space the floor, they penetrate, and they shoot the three better than anybody in basketball. You know, last night they made 12 or 13 threes. I mean, you're not going to beat a team that's making 12 threes in a playoff game. Uh, we were talking about this yesterday when I was talking to Steve Kerr, and I said, why is it when we talk about Tim Duncan, or great players of all time, Tim Duncan doesn't go get into the conversation. But then people do readily acknowledge he's the best power forward in the history of the game. Yeah. Oh, well, listen, it's, it's all that that thing Pop's got going down there. He, You know, he's got them <laughs> always under the radar. And yet, always really, really good, and most times great. And so, uh, that's part of their thing, you know. They uh, he plays that up by not playing it up, right? Well, he plays it down, and then, yeah. and then it, play, it plays down, and then it, <laughs> that means it plays up, I mean, or whatever. Yeah. You know, it's just uh, that's how they do things. And and for me, you know, he's he's the greatest coach we've ever seen in this league because during this era where it's so competitive and the competitive balance is better than it was back in the dynasty days of Boston, LA, LA, et cetera. You know, he has the same system and he's basically turned it all the way over with the exception of one guy, Tim Duncan. And he's, he's still winning at an extremely high level. So you put him above Phil Jackson. I do based on that, uh, because he hasn't had the same kind of talent, um, that Phil has had in terms of just the, the magnitude of the of, of the greatness of players, you know, guys like Bryant, Shaq, you know, and uh, on down the line. Um, and don't get me wrong, Phil's great, <laughs> but I just I just think you know what Pop's done, and look, he's been in one place for 16 years and won four championships, you know, and that's you know that's that's not going to be done again. It's good to visit with you. I know you've got a uh, few decisions to make on that team and uh, could be a pretty big turnover uh, with uh, – do you see that turnover uh, with talent there in Dallas? It's, it's possible, Dan. It's, it could go one of several different ways. Uh, there could be significant changes. Um, it's possible we could bring a lot of the same team back. Uh, but the one thing I know is we'll be very active with uh, – in, in, the, in the trading sphere, um, in the draft – uh, and free agency, too. And uh, there are a lot of things up in the air, but we do have options. And, uh, you know, I view it as an exciting time. I'd play up that Bird said I was the smartest player that uh, he ever played with, if I were you, Rick. I'm going to work with that. You know what? Bird Bird will be fine with it, right? I mean, he rarely gave you a compliment, so I'd take that one, right? Yeah, I mean, I didn't even know about this one. <laughs>
Did he ever trash talk you and you were a teammate? Oh, come on. Oh, he did? He'd kill you? Uh, hey, listen. Uh, hey, when we, when he, after he won that first three-point shooting contest where he shot the ball and put one finger up in the air, I mean, we, none of us were ever going to hear the end of that. <laughs> what did he say when he got back to Boston? I remember we were in the bus uh, right after the All-Star break, and we were sitting back there, and he says to Danny Ainge, he goes, Danny? Danny goes, yeah. Who's the three-point king? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, that's just – and that's how it was with that team. It, it was it was constant. You know, there was always stuff going on. So I could but, just hear him going, Danny, who's the three-point king? Oh, yeah. No, I was – you, you, you do that well. <laughs> Larry Joe Bird. Hey, uh, good luck, Rick. Thanks uh, for joining us. Congrats on the contract extension. Always a pleasure, Dan. Take All care. All right, Rick Carlisle. Yeah, I thought Bird called him the smartest player he ever played with. We'll roll with it. If I'm Rick Carlisle, I'd, I'd say, hi, I'm Rick Carlisle. Larry Bird said smartest player he ever played with. I remember Carlisle would always play the piano in, in the hotel lobbies, too. When they'd go on the road, like he'd walk in, and Carlisle would you know, want to know if they had a piano there. He'd be playing piano. But it wasn't like, you know, all the Celtics are standing around, like Chief is there and, and Larry and they're all singing, Kumbaya, Lord, Kumbaya. 